Hey guys, Tyler here. There's been a lot of talk over the past few years about how some of the newer Star Trek shows and movies have deviated from franchise creator Gene Roddenberry's original vision. They're too dark, they're too action-oriented, they make a farce of their predecessors. These are all accusations that are levied at Discovery or Picard or Lower Decks or even the Kelvin Timeline movies. But some of these same criticisms were levied at Enterprise and Voyager and Deep Space Nine and even The Next Generation when they were on. And those are now beloved parts of the franchise with no question as to whether or not they're canon. But while I absolutely do believe that there are some fair criticisms of newer Star Trek to be made, uh, I want to talk about something a little different in today's video how Star Trek deviated from Gene's original vision, going all the way back to the original series and The Next Generation while they were airing. Roddenberry executive produced both of these shows and was a major creative influence on both of them, but his word was not always the end-all be-all. And while he did exert more direct control over the first two seasons of The Next Generation, by season three, when he pulled back, the writers were able to explore more diverse facets of the Star Trek universe. And many say that Gene would have been disappointed with DS9, even though it is my favorite series. So there's that. In this video, I'll discuss different aspects of the Star Trek universe, stretching across the franchise's 50 plus years of content, and examine how they differ from Gene's original conception. First things first, it's important to note that while much of Star Trek has in fact deviated from the cerebral, situation-driven, and optimistic storylines of its early days, even when the shows that Gene executive produced were on air, his ideas didn't always make it on screen. Gene's first pitch for the original series presented to Desilu in 1964, a proposal titled Star Trek Is, dot dot dot, featured a number of elements that didn't make it past the developmental stage. This would continue into the era of the TOS films and even the early days of the next generation, with some ideas abandoned or at least adapted. So here are five things about Star Trek that differed from the original plans. Number one, the name of the ship and the captain. Pertaining to Gene's original pitch for TOS, the ship was to be named the SS Yorktown and the captain Robert April. April as a character was featured in an episode of the animated series and referenced in Discovery, and he's regarded as one of the best captains in Starfleet history. The Yorktown, much like the Enterprise, would have had a crew complement in the low hundreds and uh, been capable of faster than light travel. A cruiser class vessel, the Yorktown would have also embarked on a five year mission of exploration and investigating M class worlds. April's role was later adapted into the character Christopher Pike, who, of course, was featured in Star Trek's first filmed pilot, The Cage. Number two, no transporters. That's right, one of the most iconic technologies of the original series, and of course later Star Trek, the matter transporter, was not part of Gene's original pitch. Landings by away teams would have been conducted using a small recon rocket vehicle, uh, basically a shuttle. The audience would have been able to view these landings through telescreens, much like the view screens that eventually made it onto the bridge of Starfleet ships. Of course, one of the many reasons that shuttles were ultimately not used for away missions that much uh, and were placed with transporters was because of production costs. It was cheaper and easier to show the crew beaming from one place to another instead of entering and exiting a shuttlecraft every time, giving rise to many a conversation about whether the transporter kills you. Number three, the galaxy was to be filled with mostly non-humanoid aliens. Again, due to budgetary limitations, we only got to see limited examples of non-humanoid species. But the prevalence of non-humanoids throughout the galaxy, even alongside the thousands of humanoid species who can trace their origins back to the progenitors, makes sense. Many of these species would come from planets with environments that are downright hostile to humanoid life, such as the Tholians, who hail from a class Y planet with a sulfuric acid rich environment. Later installments would actually show far fewer non-humanoid aliens than even TOS, 
despite advances in both practical effects and CGI, opting for more budget-friendly humanoid aliens of the week. Thankfully, we have the animated shows to make up for this. Number four, the hydroelectric dam that never was. This one comes from Gene's novelization of the motion picture, in which he describes how in the mid-21st century, a number of Mediterranean countries come together to construct a massive dam across the Straits of Gibraltar, lowering the Mediterranean Sea by 60 meters. This would have the effect of generating the entire electricity supply of Europe and Northern Africa, as well as freeing up new fertile farmland north of the Sahara. The only problem with this is, well, we've seen seen plenty of instances of Earth's surface in Star Trek in the future and, well, this dam and its effects are just not there. The fact that we see this hasn't happened in canon indicates to me that humanity opted for other revolutionary food production techniques, such as vertical farming, as well as more efficient distribution of resources to existing population centers. Number five, the use or non-use of money. Gene was a very socialistic, utopian thinker. In his idealistic worldview, humanity would have evolved past the need for petty things like currency. Yeah, so uh, this has been covered in detail by uh, lots of other YouTubers, as well as, you know, just writers and bloggers in general. But um, yeah, the Federation does have currency. It's called the Federation Credit. The credit is used as a medium of exchange in various transactions, often when trading with other powers, such as the Ferengi. When Julian Taylor says, Don't tell me they don't use money in the 23rd century. And uh, Kirk says, Well, we don't. Really what that means is that the kind of paper currency that you and I are familiar with, that people carry around in their everyday lives to pay for things like food, would no longer be a thing. And furthermore, Jean-Luc Picard states in First Contact that humanity has evolved past the accumulation of material wealth as the main driving force in life. Earth in Star Trek's future is a world where everyone's basic needs are met, and being human is about improving oneself and one's society. This is definitely still a very utopian vision by today's standards, but the idea that Earth would just straight up abandon currency like some sort of anarcho-communist society is an idea that the writers mostly just ignored. Gene had plenty of other ideas about the way human behavior would change in a very short amount of time over the span of centuries, such as evolving past interpersonal conflict. This was attempted in the first two seasons of TNG, but the writers felt it was too constraining and made it difficult to write dramatic television. I definitely think it's for the best that some of these ideas, particularly uh, ones about human nature, were either adapted or discarded as Gene's tight grip over Star Trek loosened. The way that DS9 critically examines the Federation's utopian society and tests its perseverance through storylines like the Dominion War is one reason that show is so fascinating to me. Even before the Dominion War arc, showing how life really is on the frontier and dealing with oppressive aliens like the Cardassians really gave us an appreciation for just how good the Enterprise crew seems to have it. In any case, expanding the scope of the Star Trek universe in this way has always been a good thing, in my view. It's still essential, I think, for Star Trek to remain optimistic sci-fi, to set it apart from other bleak dystopian fiction, but adding a little grit to the universe never hurt anyone, in my opinion, and it makes the universe more believable, and thus, more interesting. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do that as well so you won't miss future uploads and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you think I deserve it and you want to support me even further, then becoming a patron or a member is a great way to do so. Links to those as well as my social media and merch store are in the description. That's all I have for this week. Live long and prosper. Thank you.